Hey, it's time for VoiceOver Body Shop, and tonight we've got a great guest, a lovely actress and voice actor and all sorts of stuff, and coach, so we're going to talk all about that, Elise Burgreen. Hi, Elise, how you doing? Hi, doing well. Thank you all for having me today. I appreciate it. And we, you know, if you've got a question for, throw it in the chat room. I know Jeff Holman's hiding out in there somewhere, and he will reload those questions to us, and we will get those to Elise in a little bit. Um, and... You ready, George? Yeah, you're going to tell us about our trip to your friend to France or what? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. I, yes, I'm going to talk about my trip to France. So, <laughs> okay, <good. laughs> voiceover body shop right now. From the outer reaches, they came, bearing the knowledge of what it takes to properly record your voiceover audio. And together, from the center of the VO universe, they bring it to you now. George Widom, the engineer to the VO stars, a Virginia Tech grad with the skills to build, set up, and maintain the professional VO studios of the biggest names in VO today. And you, Dan Leonard, the voiceover home studio master, a professional voice talent with the knowledge and experience to help you create a professional sounding home VO studio. And each week, they allow you into their world, bringing you talks with the biggest names in the voiceover world today, letting you ask your questions, and giving you the latest information to make the most of your voiceover business. Welcome to VoiceOver Body Shop. VoiceOver Body Shop is brought to you by VoiceOverEssentials.com, home of Harlan Hogan Signature Products, Source Elements, remote studio connections for everyone, VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website isn't a pain in the butt. VOHeroes.com, become a hero to your clients with award-winning voiceover training. JMC Demos, when quality matters. And VoiceOver Extra, your daily resource for VO success. And now, live to drive from their super secret clubhouse and studio in Sherman Oaks, California. Here are the guys. Well, hello there. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittam muting my speakers. <laughs> and this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. BS. All right. Well, it is good to be back. Thank you for coming back, you know, as we're doing this show live tonight. I was in France for two weeks. So you're in another time zone right now. Well, nah, you, I adjusted. Advanced, if you start spacing out. No, no, no I'll, I'll be fine. I, you know, I, 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 I stayed up late when I got home Saturday and woke up at seven. I'm like, eh, back on Pacific time. So that was great. But it was fabulous. If you get the chance to go to France, go. The funny thing was, is that I kept running into people. Uh, you know, I, the, the people I wanted to run into, I didn't, you know, Rebecca Davis was also in Paris at the same time. Did I run into her? No, I ran into all sorts of other people, but I will relate one quick, funny story. I was, we were on a Viking cruise and if you know, Viking at all, it's, they're small, you know, they're, they call them long ships. And my wife and I were having dinner on the, on the patio and in, in, on the front of the boat and it got windy. So we went, went, went inside, saw somebody sitting at a table. Uh, I was like, hey, can we sit with you? Oh, sure, sit down. Because this is what goes on on, on Viking. It's like you're meeting people because it's not like 3,000 people. It's like, you know, 125. And uh, somebody had told me there was somebody on the ship from Buffalo, which I'm from originally. And, um, and so we're talking like, oh, you're the guy from Buffalo. Yeah, really? What do you do? Well, I'm a lawyer. Oh, that's fabulous. What do you do? I'm a, I'm a voice actor. He goes, oh, do you know Dan Leonard? Uh, and Marcy's like, <laughs> this is Dan Leonard. You can't make that up. Yeah. I haven't seen He was my lawyer 28 years ago. I did not recognize him. He did not recognize me, <laughs> but we're on a boat on the Rhone river, somewhere between Avignon and Lyon. And I run into this guy and it was, <laughs> but it was like that the whole time we were running into people here and there, but, but did Wonderful. not run into Rebecca Davis. Oh, so, so back with your back, we got to get together anyway. <laughs> yeah, really. Compare notes about France. The right. food was fabulous. Everybody says they love Paris. I had no idea why until I went to Paris, and now I understand. So, congrats. Great time. You had a great time. You came back healthy. Sorry that yeah. your sons are not so healthy, right? 
So, yeah, well, no, they're fine now. The second I get home, it's like, you know, it's coming back to the Petri dish here. Dad, like, I think yeah, I have here, have some germs. <laughs> but That's I'm why fine. we're not there physically. With, otherwise, we would have been there with you tonight. Right. For sure. Yes. Next time. And that's right. So, but enough of that, because we have a great guest tonight, and we want to talk to her. Uh, Elise Bergeron is an actor, voice artist, and producer based in Los Angeles and Atlanta. Uh, she's got a lot of recent credits, like she was on Shameless and the Mysterious Benedict Society. But she can also be heard worldwide as the voice of American Express, Ross for Dress for Less. Yeah, we all see those. Uh, Sonic Smart Clinic, Clean and Clear, as Daisy in the colorful young adult fil a series Finn and Daisy, and many more. And as a UCLA producing program alumnus, Elise coaches and mentors actors in navigating and understanding the entertainment business, which is what we want to talk about tonight. Her curriculum is a comprehensive educational program supporting working actors to gain knowledge, skills, network, and find resources to level up, manage success, and become, I love this, the CEO of their own career. Let's welcome yeah. to VoiceOver Body Shop, Elise Bergreen. Elise, welcome Hi. to the show. Thank you so much. I'm happy to be here. We're happy to have you. Uh, it's we've been, you know, it's like I who we're gonna get as a guest, and George said, "Oh, we gotta get Elise on." So it's like, okay, great. Now, <laughs> just from the introduction, I can see you do a lot of stuff, and we can get into that. But can, can give us a little bit about your background. How do you get into acting? Did you like start young and just keep on going, or or what? Well, it's actually a small world. Uh, I, George and I have been connected for a while on the voiceover side of things. But when I first started out, I was in theater. And I didn't realize I have always loved film and television. I've loved voiceover and, you know, everything from Pixar movies to commercials. I used to narrate things for fun. And I thought that that just wasn't a viable career path. I don't know why it appeared to me that, like, going to do theater <laughs> was as a kid and, like, being a movie star was out of touch. But... Or, or whatever other facet of that. And when I was in college, I was studying theater and I was doing advertising journalism. I was one of those little nuts that got a couple of degrees. And <laughs> I had this epiphany. There was a voiceover class that was offered for the first time in my college. And it was like this big thing that they weren't just going to focus on radio because they thought that like radio was dying. And they're like, we're going to teach you guys like audio narration and also how to read for commercials because that's like the new big thing. Yep. And in college, like colleges, you know, I only graduated a little over five years ago. So that was like an, a really big new thing. And I said, OK, I'm going to do it. I was a singer. I was doing theater and we did a radio drama that ended up going to NPR. And I signed with an agent about a month after I graduated because of it. And Jeez. they said, well, you already sing, you do theater, you narrate for all these other things. Why haven't you thought of doing voiceover? And I said, I don't know. I just, I guess it sounded so it's like a secret society that you couldn't get into unless you knew the right people. And it, you know, it does sometimes feel like that, but once you get more into it and you meet lovely people like yourselves, I've learned and met so many people through your program, through George, it's been such a gift. So I got into this kind of by falling into it a little by accident, thinking that performing was the gate and then, then finding this was an option. Yeah. Gee, when I went to college, it was learning computer language with Thinking punch that cards. Thinking performing was the gate, and then, then finding this was... Somebody, somebody's yep, that got, would be me. That was that you, George. Me. I is Blue. a professional. Yeah. <laughs> Blew a perfect joke about you know the fact that I learned computer programming on punch cards. That's so amazing. It, <laughs> and I learned live stream producing while live streaming. <laughs> while watch live streaming. <laughs> Yeah. Well, it's great that, you know, so you went to school, you know, when this was becoming popular and it's great yeah. that they're teaching that now. And, uh, and I'm sure a lot of, a lot of the people that are watching tonight probably got the same, the start the same way. What are you up to right now? I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, you've been on shameless, you've been on a lot of stuff and anything that you're working on right now that you can tell us about, or that's um, going to be coming out soon. Yeah. So, uh, season 11, the last season of shameless just aired on Netflix. So if you guys haven't caught that, I'm on right. season 11 playing Zofia Milkovich. So if you guys know the, the Milkoviches and the Gallagher's, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. that's um, why you look familiar. Okay. <laughs> there it is. Um, I also coming up in the fall. I am on a Disney Plus show called The Mysterious Benedict Society uh, with Tony Hale and Kristen Shaw. So that'll be coming out this fall. 
And it's been a really exciting time. Voiceover has been picking up. Uh, I just recently became one of the voices of Sonic, uh, the drive-through, not the hedgehog. <laughs> <laughs> so I get to talk about delicious food all day. Yeah. Um, it's been really incredible. Yeah. So how, how did you get? You were said a little bit about how you got into voiceover, yeah. but you know, what, what really you know, pushed you into that? I mean, we find that there's a lot of actors, especially when the pandemic hit. A lot of yeah. voice act, or a lot of on-screen actors had a shift to voiceover, mm -hmm. which made us busier than, you know, a one arm paper hanger, uh, <laughs> getting people to you know, get their studio set up and stuff. But yeah. how did you initially get into it? And what was some of the first stuff you did? Um, to be honest, so my, I come from a family of doctors and they were very logical. They didn't think that the arts was always a reliable career, even though they supported <laughs> me to do it. And they said, yeah. just in case it ever doesn't go your way or, you know, the income's not there or the jobs dry up for a little while because it is such an ebb and a flow. Uh, you should study some more practical things that will give you some stability in life. And, uh, one of those was advertising. The other was journalism. So, I started off by working for NBC and Fox in college and writing advertising copy mm. and doing the advertising side of things. So I got an honors degree in that and I started understanding voiceover from the other side, from the creative agency side. So I'm sort of maybe a more unique case, but honestly, the more people I meet in voiceover, many of them have worked on the advertising and marketing and public relations side of things because they are the ones writing the copy, creating the commercials, the jingles, the whatever else, and they say, hey, I can do that. So I kind of had a very similar epiphany where I said, I'm already singing, I'm doing theater, I have a degree in advertising, I'm working at you know 30 Rockefeller, there's no reason that I couldn't be the voice on this commercial instead of this other person, why am I not doing it? And I started getting into classes. Hmm, yeah. uh, taking classes, people gotta remember, take the classes from the good coaches with that have successful clientele mm -hmm. and that's that's definitely going to help you uh, move on a little bit how, uh, actually, how a, did you pick a coach ahead. actually to be honest uh i think that journey is a little unique for everybody but i actually yeah. learned a fair amount from picking some of the wrong coaches yeah. um and yeah. i don't mean wrong as in they were terrible or they're bad they just weren't the right fit and you know People are unique. It's like we choose our friends. Sometimes you find the right coach and you click, but I've learned an immense amount from taking across the spectrum with many different coaches and all of them have incredibly different coaching styles. And if I found one and I said, you know, it's really good to know how to work with this kind of coaching because you never know what kind of voiceover director or booth director you're going to get. You never know what kind of creative agency feedback you're going to get. I mean, I've worked with clients over Source Connect and in the studio that are like, just do less. I'm sorry, can you quantify what mm. do less means, right? So like the idea of like how to find a coach, I mean, of course, talking to people like yourselves and finding out, you know, if somebody is really that great, usually a lot of people will recommend them and their name will keep coming up and then you try them out. And if you don't love it, you move on to the next. Um, but my greatest growth has been coming from studying with lots of people and talking to lots of people as opposed to just sticking with one thing because you learn how to interact with everybody. Yeah. It's sort of like dating. You got to find the right yeah. fit for you. Uh, you know, I think we yeah. all go through that. Once again, our guest is Elise Burgreen. And if you have a question for Elise, and I'm sure as we discuss things along here, things are going to pop into your mind. As soon as you do, write them down in the chat room, whether you're watching on Facebook or on uh, YouTube. Uh, there's a chat room in there, and Jeff Holman is sitting there writing down everything that you say and relaying it to us, and then we will ask Elise that question when uh, <laughs> when the time comes. So uh, get those questions in. So you, you you do a lot of crossover stuff. I mean, you're, you're, you're doing voiceover, and you're doing the on-screen stuff uh, successfully on both sides here. How do you how do you work it all together? How do you you know? I mean, do you have an agent for on screen and for voiceover, and, and do they talk to each other or what? It's a little unique for everybody, but I will say in my specific case, uh, I do have reps for both. They don't really interact. Sometimes they do. Uh, when I was first starting off, I had one rep that was across the board for everything, and each department was all under the same umbrella. And then as my career shifted and grown, I have reps in different regions for different purposes. And I personally really enjoy that they are somewhat separate now because it can get very confusing. Uh, and But it just depends on the reps you're with. 
some teams, they're great and they'll say this department handles this, this department handles that, and you'll be separate and, you know, they don't really cross pollinate. Some communicate. It just depends on the specific team. I've, I've tried a few at this point and kind of found what works for me. Uh, I definitely have reps in different regions, which is really helpful. That way they kind of just focus on their pocket of focus. Um, I've definitely seen for myself that it's been more helpful to have people that focus on one or two particular things as opposed to try to be everything for everyone because it's just really hard to do that. And I even had to choose that for myself. It does seem like I do everything, but even the things I do have been limited and narrowed down and funneled down almost, you know? Uh, there are a lot of on-camera actors that choose to focus on on-camera commercials. I personally really enjoy voiceover a lot more. So I chose to, you know, kind of eliminate on-camera commercials for the most part. You know, it's not something I focus on. If they come up, I'll, I'll entertain it. But I really decided to focus because it does feel at times like I have more than one career. And they really don't overlap as much as I originally anticipated. And I think if somebody had told me that when I graduated at 22 and said, hey, just so you know, you're going to pursue two different careers at the same time. They really don't talk a lot. Good luck. I probably would have <laughs> done this a lot differently. Or honestly, I probably would have just pursued one. And I'm so grateful that I'm where I'm at now. But, you know, it's kind of like the saying goes, if somebody had explained to you how hard it was going to be in full, then you probably wouldn't have done what you did to get there. Uh, it's been the same journey with this. It, it really is learning on the fly, learning as you go, adjusting, pivoting, and figuring it out. But my greatest advice and the reason that I encourage people to understand the business side of it and understand their own approach is there are only two things you really need to be successful. Talent is really not one of them. There are lots of people that are not considered the most talented people in the business that are working. It doesn't mean they're not talented at all, but like you don't have to be the reincarnation of, you know, anybody or anything to be working in this industry, you have to understand how to keep yourself motivated and be a self-starter. And you have to understand how to pivot when things go wrong and or don't go perfectly or need to be shifted because there are lots of people that just lose motivation and they're not working, not because of their talent. I know people that went to Juilliard who aren't working both on camera and in voiceover, and it has nothing to do with their talent. It has solely to do with the fact that unlike an office setting, this is a career in which no one's checking in on you all the time. No one's telling you, you have to get your auditions in. If you don't turn your auditions in, you get dropped. It's as simple as that. Like you get to inspire yourself to do it. And if you don't, you don't, you know? And a lot of the progress you will make in this career has to be you going to educate yourself. It's not like a master's program where they educate you, they connect you to the right connections. There's a networking circle. Like, thank God for programs like yours, educational platforms. I was just uh, telling George when we linked up this last week that your platform was one of the first things I discovered when I became a voice actor uh, and really started focusing on this, especially determining like what city to live in, who to train with, what kind of gear to have. I mean, I'm fairly tech savvy and I would have not been able to feasibly do any of this without educational platforms like your guys's. So thank you for doing this. Oh, well, you're quite welcome. So you you were saying that, you know, you you enjoyed voiceover a lot more than, than doing the on-camera commercials and stuff. Yeah. What is it that you really enjoy about voiceover that, that uh, attracted you to be, you know, to really specialize in that? There's so much more freedom than the rest of the business. I love on camera and I will always do on camera. It's something that I feel a, a different kind of freedom. You get to escape into a character by physically looking like them, feeling like them, all that that extra stuff, the hair, the makeup, the scenery, the, et cetera. But voiceover, there's nothing holding you back. You're in a box and nobody gives an F what you look like. And you step into that box and you get to be whatever you are capable of being. Most of the voices I do are not my normal speaking voice. And it is an incredible gift that whether you're in the studio and you're in jeans and a t-shirt and you get to be all these things that are in your head, or if I'm in my pajamas and I get to walk down my hallway to go do my job every day, there's no one stopping me from being whoever I need to be. And there are so many other limitations when it comes to other aspects of performance, like theater, on camera, all these other things, you, you know, your height, your weight, your 
eye color, your speaking tone, your the way you move your body, your physical movements. These are all things that matter for other aspects of performance that just don't matter the same way in voiceover. I mean, they affect your performance maybe, but no one's. it's not a make or break thing if I'm 5'7 versus 5'10 or if I'm brunette and I've shaved my head. Uh, you know, none of that matters. And that's such a cool thing. Like, you, I get to be whoever I want. And if something, if I break my leg, I still get to go to work every day. And there are a lot of other aspects of performance where you're down for the count if you're physically not at the peak performance, which as humans, it is really reassuring that knowing if I ever have a human moment where I'm not <laughs> physically maybe at the the best, you know, space or something happens or I can always still have a home and voiceover. It's accepting of so many people no matter where you are or what you're doing or what you look like or what you're doing. It's just amazing. Yeah. As we like to say, no one needs to see how the sausage is made. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, cause you, know, you, you, you can, you know, you can be Jessica rabbit for all we know. And, yeah. and it's, and, and as long as you do the voice, right, that's the most important thing acting. You know, and I, it's really important for people in voiceover to understand that it is acting. Uh, it's, it's not reading. It's not like, oh, here's copy and you read it. It's what do you bring to it? What, what is it that's unique about you that, that works there? And it sounds like yeah. what's, what's unique with you is you can be just about anybody because you're, you're a well-accomplished and well-trained actress. Well, that's very kind of you. I don't know about anybody. We're still working on that one, but it is a really freeing thing that there are fewer boxes is maybe a better way to phrase it. There's just fewer people telling you what you can't be, they're just open to hearing what you can be. And there are so many opportunities. I mean, in one week, I'll read for a baby, a toddler, a teenage boy, a young female in college, a young mom, and like a grandma, all in the same week. And then also like do medical copy, and then a commercial, and then animation, and then some warrior badass in a video game. And I get to be so many people, and so many characters, and I get to put on different voices that are so separate from me as a person, which is really freeing because there are a lot of arts careers that, you know, it's so attached to you as a person, your identity, as opposed to what you can create. Yeah. Well, that's so great. You, if you, Go ahead, George. No, it's, I just know that you, I wanted to make sure we got in some time for you to talk about producing and yeah. why ah, yes. you do it. Cause you have, you're doing obviously enough, but it seems like enough stuff, right? So why did you add <laughs> producing to your quiver of skills and, and, what does it do for you as the actor? Producing opens doors that just would not have otherwise opened, to be very frank about it. Uh, the power is a lot of times in a few different areas. It's usually in producing, executive producing, directing, uh, sometimes writing, but even that's sort of its own hurdle. And if you are one of the creative decision makers, you hold the cards. And I got to a point in my career where I've always done production work, both on camera and the voiceover side with my background in like advertising and marketing and creation. I've always done that side of things, but I didn't directly tie it to creating my own work just for me or just for the people I know or trying to sell that content until I realized that there was this limiting belief in my own head that actually was pretty accurate in which all the control that I had in my career was being given to other people. And I didn't really love that. That, you, you know, it's up to other people. It's up to the casting director, the director. They decide what happens to your career. You know, all you do is you bring your gift to the table. And at the end of the day, they decide if you're right or not. And it is a really incredible thing to be able to say, actually, you may not see the full picture of who I am or what I'm capable of. And I'm going to do this thing anyway, whether or not you can see that I'm capable of doing it. And a lot of doors have opened for me that would not have otherwise because whether you're 5'2 and a, you know, fiery anything or, you know, whatever your ethnicity is, your background, your skin tone, your voice quality, whatever it is, you get to decide what you're capable of and then you get to go make it if you have the skills to do so. And coming from a family of doctors, I was always led to find ways to take charge of my career and to create my own opportunities. And as incredible as acting is, it just doesn't, those decisions are left to the people that are financing it and creating it. And that's right. usually not the, you know, not always. And you see, like George and I had spoken about the other day, that is more often becoming the actor that is being in charge of those creative decisions. But, you know, 
more than 20 years ago, that was not very common. And I think I'd rather be in charge of telling stories that I feel really connected to if this is the path I chose, uh, at least more often. Right. Well, what does producing involve? I mean, people hear the word producer and they don't necessarily know what that means. You know, sometimes if somebody's been on a show for a while, suddenly you see associate producer, executive producer, executive producer, they just sort of lend their names to it. I get the impression that perhaps you really are active when you do the producing. What does that involve? It's different depending on what field you're in. So uh, it's different for on camera versus voiceover. And again, it's different for television versus film. So the the role of producer can consist of, you know, just like everyone can say they're a voice actor, but whether you do everything or do you do video games, do you do animation, do you do commercials, do you do narration? There are so many definitions of what truly a producer does and can do and who gets that credit and why. But the best summary of it without, you know, sending everybody through a small college course in this uh, chat that we have today is... If you are one of the decision makers that is making the project possible, not you're helping it along. Usually if you're helping it along, but you're not one of the main decision makers that's doing the legwork, getting the bicycle going, that usually would consist of more of like an associate producer, or if you're helping finance, maybe an executive producer position. But again, that's different for television versus film. But, you know, everything from paperwork, to getting financing, to getting the actor signed on, to getting contracts, deals, getting distribution, making the day-to-day happen, whether you're in the studio or you're on set, um, making all of the stuff that maybe doesn't always seem so glamorous, but those are the big decisions that make a project happen. And then, of course, the fun stuff is getting to be on set or getting well, to be in the booth. Well, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you've been, you, you started coaching people. How did you get in, into coaching? And what, what it, it sounds like you've got you're taking all of this information that you're telling us right now and you've created your philosophy of what people need to learn. And as I, we introduced at you at the beginning of the show, you say, become the CEO of your own career. And what do you mean by that? Yeah. To be honest, it developed over time. I love giving back and I've always helped with like programs, but I've never thought to start my own. And I was working a, a decent amount and I was very lucky and fortunate to do so. But also I worked really hard to get there and I had more and more people reach out to me one on one saying like, how did you do this? How did you get there? How did you create this? And I was like, well, I don't really know. I just did it. And then I started really thinking about like, wait, how did I get here? And what were the key elements that got me to where I am now or helped other friends of mine that I've helped along the way or they've helped me to pivot along this journey to make the decisions that really were so, so vital. And once I started to really figure that out over the pandemic, I started saying, hey, for any friends who are interested, I'm just going to get on Zoom for an hour or two and you guys can just like ask me whatever and I'll just do my best. You know, I'm like, at the time I was like, what, 26? And I'm like, I have no idea what I'm doing other than the fact that I had gone to the UCLA producing program. You know, I graduated with a couple degrees. I've been produced. I've been doing the work, but I didn't really know how to give that back to other people. And I kind of got a crash course during the pandemic of how to be a, a more decent coach. So uh, students, be really nice to your coaches. It's not easy. <laughs> and it's it takes a lot of time, effort, stamina, uh, tenacity as a coach to figure out, and I'm still learning from my coaches how to do that best, of what to share and what to not and what's helpful when and how do you share things with your clients or students that will help them without overwhelming them. And how do you share for where they're at right now so that you don't necessarily let them get in their own way? Because I know that I sometimes was in the pursuit of knowledge so much so that I got overwhelmed with too much information at once. So learning kind of how to break that down in a more digestible way, just based on people asking me for advice. And then it kind of turned into this whole coaching business. And now it's like, wow, this is, I can help people. And my tagline has kind of become with my, my coaching students and uh, clients. I hope that me doing it the hard way can save you a couple of days, months, years, or whatever else, time, energy, tears, sadness, heartbreak. Me doing it the hard way can save that for you by you and I interacting. Hopefully you can learn from my mistakes and you can take the shortcut that I didn't have because I wish I had had some of those shortcuts, but even then, some of the shortcuts just maybe weren't for me or maybe I worked, figured out how they could work for other people and 
you guys have been great coaches along the way for me in that regard. Yeah. Does all this sound familiar, George? I mean, <laughs> just, yeah. I mean, the whole be a mini CEO, I talk about that all the time. Mm -hmm. I tell myself that all the time. Yeah. Remind myself I don't need to do everything. And then the, the yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of commonalities that, that, that ring true for sure. Yeah. And, and it's important to bring that which you have, you know, what is it that you bring to the table from your life experience, from all the different things that we've done? And apply it, you know. I was in yeah. life insurance. I taught for a while, you know, and I was in broadcasting. It all came together for 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 voiceover, and and, and you. And I taught for a while too. I just forgot. I almost forgot that I taught. I taught yeah. kids, and when I was in high school and middle school, I taught little kids. Yeah, I didn't realize that Incredible. later in life that was going to be so valuable. And then now I teach people all the time. It's just part of what we have to do every single day. We're not just telling people plug this thing into this hole and turn the knob here and then it's no it's teaching it's coaching it's absolutely it's all part of it yeah so if you're doing all this different stuff i i imagine that you know if you're like on location you know i i always say you know you, know, you want voice work you know make plane reservations it's it it, it yeah. never it never never fails exactly yeah. exactly you know <laughs> uh, uh yeah I, I i i'm sitting there in paris and someone says can you get this to me tonight i'm like no <laughs> it's like it's not happening. I, I'm going out like, to dinner. Sorry, I'm on a Viking ship. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, but uh, and it's noisy here, so it's not going. You can do it on your phone. No, I'm not doing that. It's not going to happen. <laughs> hey, have any, anything interesting happened to you while you're on location, or where you get a job, and and how did you? What did you do? Yes, um, I definitely resonate with that. Uh, you know, France is pretty cool. I'll have to have that experience in France. Um, <laughs> I need a beret too. Yeah, the food uh, was great. Yeah. Oh God, it sounds amazing. I have had a very interesting time. As I kind of mentioned before, it really does feel like I have two very separate careers that I'm kind of chasing down veering lanes at times in more of a wide direction than a parallel. <laughs> and it can be really tough because in the film on camera world, I mean, my days start at 12 hours a day. And there are times where you're on location, especially depending on if you work in film and television and it's all over the place. And one of the projects that I was so grateful to work on recently, I went straight from a couple weeks in Atlanta right to this project in Montana. And I got a call. There's a small time change uh, in Montana. And so I get a call from my reps and a text saying, hey, we know it's late at night. It's about 8.30, 8.45 p.m. Uh, we need this in an hour. And I'm filming a period piece that's set in medieval times. I'm wearing like a burlap sack <laughs> uh, as a wardrobe. And I'm in the middle of the You're mountains. wearing your voiceover suit. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, right? And I'm thinking, but we had a later call time that day. We didn't start until super late. It was close enough to the end of the business hours of the day that I was like, I can get away with not bringing my whole voiceover travel setup to leave in my trailer. You know, if who's going to call me at 8 or 9 p.m.? wrong so i'm on set and i get this this message and they're like we need it an hour so i go to my first ad and the director and i said is there any chance we can like move some stuff around i just need like 15 minutes like that's it just just imagine that i'm you know i need a minute or something and they're like yeah that's fine so they were amazing an amazing team they completely kind of rearranged two of the scenes that we were going to shoot so i could have a moment and I go back to my trailer and I realize that we are so deep in the mountains of Montana. We're out in Prey, Montana, which is past uh, any town by an hour. And it's in this small valley that's known for like wildlife that will eat you called Paradise <laughs> Valley, Montana. Ironically enough, because I'm from Paradise Valley, Arizona. So I am texting my mom the irony of this because I have one bar of service. And I come out of my trailer and I'm like, okay, what do we do? I don't have enough service to do this. I don't have my computer with me or anything uh, that can get service because I don't, my hotspot's not working because I don't have enough cell service. So I ask the whole crew and one person has a cell carrier that has two bars. And I'm like, great, that's all we need. We need two bars of service, that's it. So uh, my trailer, there's a generator hooked up to it. And generators, if anybody's ever been on set, they make noise or if you've ever had, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm like, well, darn it. Like, it's really cold, so they can't turn the generators off or else the trailers will get too cold and the wall freeze. So they're like, well, if you want, one of the crew guys that has, like, a big, like, GMC Ford-type truck, you can go sit in their truck, and it's far enough away from the noise, but it's still on set, you know, near set that you can go sit in there and record it. And I go, okay, cool. 
So one of the PAs kind of that's like, I don't know, has like a bear whistle or something. I still <laughs> obviously I'm from Arizona. I'm not used to bears. And he's like, yeah, I got you. I got you. So he walks me over to the truck. He get me all set up and I'm recording on my phone with my little attachments. And he walks back and he comes back over and he says. <laughs> with like no audible words. And I'm like recording this thing for a brand I can't mention right now. And it's like this commercial spot that requires that I be kind of upbeat and like very chill millennial read. And I'm like, yeah, and this and that and this and that. And I look at him and he's going. Like, and this guy does not look like he get panicked. He's got a bear whistle, right? Like he <laughs> understands what he's doing. And he just points and he goes. And I look over and about maybe a hundred yards or less away in a tree, there's a full size cougar. In the tree. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> and then he texts me with the one bar of service I have. And he says, you see the cougar? Yeah, down the road, there's a bear right now. And I'm like, this is not real. This can't be real. This is not a real thing. This is not happening. And he, I'm like, ha ha, very funny. And he goes, no, I'm serious. Don't leave the car. <laughs> <laughs> Lions and, like, and tigers and bears. Oh, my. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, this is due in 30 minutes. And he's like, do you want to die? And I was like, cool, cool, cool. I'll stay here. So I contact a, a ma again, the reason that community in this industry is so important. Get to know your coaches, get to know friends, make friends, get to know people in this industry. With the one bar of service I have and one of my crew members' phones that has two, I call one of my buddies in the industry and I go, you'll never believe what I'm dealing with right now. And he goes, I can only imagine. And he, you know, I tell him about the cougar and the bear and whatever. And I say, I can't leave the car. So I have no way to get this audition edited because my computer is in my trailer, which is like 50 feet away from me right now. But I can't get it in by 9, 930 when they wanted it. And he goes, OK, I got you. So I use the two bars of cell service and Wi-Fi from my crew member's phone, send it through that. He edits it and turns it in for me because he's just a lifesaver and reasons to make friends in the industry. But the things that you will have to do in your career, hopefully there will be no cougars or bears. But like being in France, you have to do some crazy stuff to keep up with the demands of this industry. And you got to make it happen on the fly no matter what. you got to be ready. Absolutely. <laughs> and on that note, we're going to take a quick break. We're talking with Elise Burgreen uh, about, oh, by the way, did you book the job? <laughs> I got a call back. So oh, okay. Waiting. All right. Well, that's. Still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> All righty. If you've got a question for Elise, uh, throw it in the chat room, whether you're on Facebook or on YouTube, and we will get to those questions right after this break. So we'll be right back with Elise Burgreen here on VoiceOver Body Shop. Don't go away. Well, hello there. I bet you weren't expecting to hear some big-voiced announcer guy on your new orientation training for Snapchat, were you? This is Virgin Radio. Well, okay, we're not that innocent. There's jeans for wearing and there's jeans for working. Dickies, because I ain't here to look pretty. She's a champion of progressive values, a leader for California, and a voice for America. It's smart. It's a phone. It's a smartphone. But it's so much more. It's a, the files are ready. Don't forget to pick up the eggs. What time is hockey practice? Check out this song. It's the end of the road for Rick. It's just you and me, Rick. When hope is lost. The I-8 from BMW. Who said saving the planet couldn't be stylish? Hey, it's J. Michael Collins. Bet you think I'm going to try and sell you a demo now, huh? I think they speak for themselves. But I will give you my email. It's jmichael at jmcvoiceover.com. Now, if Dan will stop waxing his mustache for a minute, we'll get back to the show. Hey, is there a perfect voiceover gift? Well, you're looking at it right now. The VoiceOver Essentials gift card. You know the challenge. The voiceover performer in your life wants or needs some gear for recording from home or on the road. Well, that part is easy. But you're not sure just what. You want a what? You want a what? <laughs> Solution? Send them a VoiceOver Essentials gift card, good for any of the products you see right here, and more. And right now, for a limited time only, we'll include our summertime bestseller, our VoiceOver Baseball Cap. 
free in the USA only when you purchase a gift card worth $200 or more. Our gift card will be sent directly to your email address. You can then forward it on to the recipient's email where and when you'd like it to arrive, and they'll automatically ship their gift cap to your United States billing address for free. Go to voiceoveressentials.com and click on Gift Card. Hey there, it's David H. Lawrence, the 17th proud sponsor of VoiceOver Body Shop. Hope you're enjoying the show. We do all the time. We also enjoy training people just like you who want to learn how to narrate and produce audiobooks that go on sale at Audible, uh, on Amazon, on the iTunes bookstore. We show you how to get that done. We show you how to add that whole process to your voiceover weaponry, right? To your quiver. If you'd like to join us for the summer class, we're making it even easier on your cash flow to do it. We've set up a free two payment plan with no fees, no interest. You pay half this month and then half next month just before the class starts and you are in like Flynn. The URL is right here. It's acxmasterclass.com slash 2PMT. Pop on over to that link and join us for class. We can't wait to see you there. This is the Latin lover narrator from Jane the Virgin, Anthony Mendez, and you're enjoying Dan and George on The Voice of Our Body Shop. And we're back with Elise Burgreen, and uh, we're going to get to your questions right now. Uh, George, go for Let's it. Start out. This is, this, we got a lot, so we're going to see how many we can get through in 15 minutes. Let's uh, do it. <laughs> Jim McNicholas right. says, I noticed from Elise's IMDb, she started working on uh, a set as a PA, and other yeah. stuff, nine credits pre-pandemic and 16 cents. Wow. What preparation did you have to go for, to do from behind the camera to on camera? I think you talked about that a good deal, but what's, what's, yeah. a, what's something that comes to mind? Um, the quickest answer for me is I didn't, for me personally, I didn't believe that I could do my best job and my best work as an actor if I didn't fully understand what all the people who were supporting me did or what they do or how they do it. So I tried to pick up as many production jobs as I could, and I've done almost every job on a set that you can do other than a camera team. Uh, really admire camera team, but I really wanted to understand firsthand like what those people, they're supporting me to shine, and I wanted to understand how they do it and have that experience so that I can be the most educated and humble version of myself to show up fully for them. Great. Uh, Terry Briscoe asks, and I, you know, I was going to ask this too, what was it like to go on an iconic, an iconic show like Shameless, which I loved, you know, all 11 seasons and, you know, uh, having done so many different areas of entertainment and having a business focused person, what would you say is the most effective method of networking that you've done? This is a question that I get a ton from my students because a lot of people think that networking is, you know, smarmy and fake and, it's all of these things that it doesn't have to be. And it can be those things. Sometimes networking can feel very like, what can I get from you? And so I try really hard to encourage, and this is how I had to rephrase it for myself, especially after having worked in advertising, you're always asking yourself like, what can I get from the customer? And what can I give to them so they give something back to us? But then I started to rephrase that as, what can I give? What can I give to someone else? And hopefully we can foster a relationship from that as opposed to what can I get? And that has completely changed every relationship I have in the business and how I approach my life, my career, my friendships. If you can think about what you can give, even in an audition, what can I give to this client so they can get what they need? What can I give to my coach so that they can give me the best experience possible or they can feel fulfilled as a coach? How can I give to them so that I can learn and then we can become successful together? And asking what I can give as opposed to what I can get has really changed things for me. Yeah. So what did you do to audition for Shameless? Because that just a great show. And, and, and you know, I'm sure it was wonderful yeah. working with the cast there because it was all an amazing cast. Um, it was one of those shows that when I signed with my manager when I first got to L.A. And I was really, you know, I came here, fortunately enough, I worked in New Orleans and Atlanta a lot to build my resume before I came out to L.A. And I signed with my manager and I said, there's one of three shows that before they end, I have to be on. That's all I want. I have to be on one of these three shows. They are like live, breathe, and die shows for me. They are the dream. They are why I got in this business. And one of them was Shameless. And my amazing management team at Apollo Management helped me do that. And they finally got me an audition. It's the very last season. And I get an audition that is, I've seen every episode like at least once or twice. 
and I'm truly, I love the show. I was a real fan. And I had this moment where I kind of like just screamed and fell into a puddle on my floor when I saw that the audition was for Shameless. And they sent the sides over, which any of you guys know for on camera, they give you like no turnaround time. And I said, you know what? This is ballsy, but I'm going to try something a little different. And I did the audition scene, but before it, I improved. And if you guys have ever seen the show, they do this intro, like every show has an intro. And they do this intro while all the main characters are essentially saying profanities into the camera, telling them to like the cameraman, like, get out of my face, F off, like all this, because that's just the style of show that Shameless is. And I said, okay, I'm either going to book this because this is exactly what they're looking for, or this casting director is never going to call me in again. <laughs> and in the beginning of my audition, I essentially told the camera slash casting to F off and gave him the middle finger in character and said, yo, like, my name's Elise Burgreen and like, get the F out of my face. Are you effing kidding me? And I went off. And I mean, the number of profanities I put in like a, a slate in the beginning of my audition. And I sent it in and I went, oh my God, what have I just done? Oh my God. And I called my mom and I went, I think I either just made the best decision of my career or I'm never going to work again. And luckily enough, I ended up booking it, and one of the showrunners ended up making a mention about how nobody that they had seen recently had been creative enough to make an audition that included the vibe of the show, and they could tell I really was a fan, um, which was really cool. But there was definitely a moment where my manager was like, you better hope this works because you just told casting to F off while looking them in the eye. <laughs> yeah, well, that's and those are the choices you make. Absolutely. <laughs> but, you know, if you're going to lean in, lean in, right? And, uh, you know, try to do it wisely. I, I really tried to stick to the intro of the show exactly in the style that they do it. I didn't just, you know, make it up. But, yeah, <laughs> it was it was one of the bigger risks I've taken in my career to get that. <laughs> Outstanding. Crazy. Brent, uh, Brent Cantor on YouTube says, how much should we be paying for coaching? So I guess he wants to know what's fair. How much is it worth getting, it? Yeah. You know? There have been coaches where, depending on what I'm getting, like, that's worth it to me when I need it. Uh, there have been other coaches where it depends where you're at and, like, what you're you're needing from that person. It's almost like if you're just starving and you need to eat anything, you can just eat anywhere and you just need a sandwich versus if you were in the mood for a really satisfying culinary experience. It's the same thing with coaching. If you feel that you are in a point in your career or a turning point or a really big shift and you need a certain coach to get you there and only this coach or one of these few coaches can do it, then invest in yourself and make a wise investment. But also if it doesn't feel right, then there might be a reason to that and there might be some substance as to why you're feeling some resistance for that. All right. Uh, Matthew King on YouTube uh, asks, do you find it difficult to delegate work time from free time? I'm concerned that all the time spent with auditioning, managing emails might mean a sacrifice of days off. Clearly, you have some time to be with us right now, so. Yeah. <laughs> um, I will say I'm not probably the best person to ask about that. I do know a lot of people in this industry that do have a work-life balance. I will be very frank. I don't. But also, it's because I love what I do. And I a lot of people spend their social time doing things that are sort of a, a distraction from their regular life or something to get away from their job. You know, a lot of people with jobs that they don't really totally love, and this isn't everybody, but they, they go to the happy hour to like sweat off the day, to, to relax, to get off, you get it off their chest. And I just, I love what I do. So I don't feel that same lull or need to sometimes take the same kind of escape away from my career that I think a lot of people do, but there's also nothing wrong with that. So I think you have to remember that your body is your career, your vessel. This is your vessel. If your voice doesn't work, you don't work. If your body doesn't work, you don't work. So take care of yourself and make sure to give your body the, the rest, the recuperation. That also means mentally. Take care of yourself, but also know that if you really love to do, you're going to find energy that you just didn't have for other stuff that will keep you motivated. Awesome. That's great. Great advice. There's another one you're going to have a good answer to, I'm sure. Chris Robin so. <laughs> says, uh, Elise, I love what you have to say about taking charge of your own career. What was the last, uh, what was the thing that stuck out to you with the voiceover community once you became more immersed in it? Oh, easily. Uh, the people. There's 
a cutthroatness to on camera that people are willing to do a lot of things that aren't always the best. I'll, I'll just phrase it like that. But voiceover people, I mean, God, that you could be like direct competition for a role and they're like, how can I help you be better so that just one of us gets it? And like, what a cool gift that we are all so centric and helping one another succeed because we know that there's more than enough to go around. We know this community is there for us. We know that our time will come or the right spot or the right moment will be there for us. And that's just a home and a community I haven't found anywhere else is that everyone that I've met genuinely wants me to succeed no matter how well or how little they know me. And they and they want me to do the same for them. And we all just want to thrive together. And like, God, that's so cool. Yeah, because there's no casting room. We're not staring each other down, you know, and mm -hmm. and and uh, we're all snowflakes and there's work for everybody. And and I think that's one of the more yeah. important things about our community is that, you know, a rising tide floats all boats. And uh, that's the best way to look at that. A uh, separate question from from Chris Robbins says, what production would you love to take on and bring to life? One that already exists or one that has yet to be created? Well, I guess one to be. Question. Yeah. <laughs> um, my ideal goal would be to kind of do this sort of Mila Kunis meets Kristen Bell, you know, sort of thing where they get to do voiceover, animation, commercial. They get to do on camera. They get to do TV and film. Like my dream goal would be not to be limited by what people think I should be doing and get to do what I want to do and get to create so much that I never feel boxed into a character or a role or a type. Um, it's just so freeing as a performer to get to, to bounce from thing to thing. Excellent. Wow. Charles Mitchell Littman asks, who are your coaches? Who are the people you currently get your Ooh. coaching from? Um, well, George, you guys, you guys are my coaches right now. Tech coaches. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey, tech coaches, sometimes, if not most of the time, I've had more freak out tech moments than I have talent moments. So, you know, keep that in mind when you're picking your tech coaches and make sure you have people that you can rely on and talk to, because especially with so much being recording from home, you need tech people that can support you because I'm extremely tech savvy and I still have had panic moments where I need somebody to save my buns at the end of the day. And I'm so glad that I have this community of people that I can call when I have those moments. Um, a make or break coach for me recently because I have used him for on camera and also for voiceover has been PJ Auckland, uh, Dr. Dialect. He has been the reason I've been put on a veil 12 times in the last year for major network and studio projects on camera and even another five plus times for voiceover jobs that would be life changing jobs. I do a lot of accents. That's something that I have a strong home and accent work. I have an ear for it. And the main reason I've kind of soared up in that direction is entirely because of PJ Auckland recently. Good to know. Final question from Terry Briscoe. Yeah, I can relate to this. Is it weird when you coach older people, considering that you are still very young yourself? I think the first time I got nervous because I just looked at them like there was this one incredible guy and he was like, you know, older than my dad. And I was like, well, there's no way that I have information to give to him. Like he's, you know, he's crushing it and everything he's doing. And I had this epiphany that age does not denote what you can share with another person. And then asking myself again, what can I give to this person as opposed to what can I get? And I kind of let all that go. And now it doesn't matter. I, I have coaches, coaching clients that are teenagers and kids. I have other ones that are in their 20s, 30s, 70s. I have one woman that's in her 80s that just got into this. And I don't think that the one of the beautiful things about voiceover in particular, but even on camera is nobody cares. You can work. They just want to see people and they want to see you and what's unique about you. And, you know, they have stuff to teach me. All my students and clients teach me things. So what do I get to learn from them? And then what do I get to help them with? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the most experienced talent in the world. Sorry. <laughs> the most experienced talent in the world needs a coach, even if the coach yeah. doesn't technically have the experience that the student has. Like my dad was a trumpet teacher teaching kids trumpet, mostly kids, teenagers. And a fellow came to him who's my dad's contemporary and said, I want you to coach me or, you know, be my yeah. teacher. And my dad's like, telling me he's telling me this he's like i don't i don't know i mean he went to this university 
he has all this he played in this orchestra but he hasn't played in 40 years so mm -hmm. i'm like dad he clearly has stuff to learn from you don't worry about it yeah. and then he now he's coaching somebody who maybe on paper is a better musician in my dad's mind maybe or just because of his pedigree but he has something to share so right. it's great that he's been able to bust through that yeah. you know that that concern that oh i i don't have anything to teach this man he went well, to and your point schools, of view matters so. right like yeah. it's not always about where you went to school or what you know like i have students and clients of mine that graduated way before me from ivy league schools and i went to loyola university in new orleans and i'm so grateful for it but it's definitely not princeton or anything and i have students of mine that went to those ivy league schools that didn't get the business training that i got in school and even outside of school so you never know just having a different perspective no matter what your background is and how you can give that back to other people it's not necessarily about who you trained with or where you trained or when you trained or who you know, uh, you know, those are all aspects of it, but it's about your point of view and what's unique about you that you can share with someone. Yeah. And that ends the lightning round. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's where I was going for the. <laughs> anyway. Great job. No, you, yeah. you, you blew nicely done. Questions. Yeah. Elise, it has been an awesome. absolute pleasure having you with us tonight and answering Thank all those you. questions. And, uh, you know, if they want to get a hold of you for coaching, where would they go? Um, you, I always, Instagram is something I check pretty regularly, uh, at Elise Burgreen and you can, through my website, EliseBurgreen.com, you can email me, uh, EliseBurgreen at gmail.com and happy to get in touch with anybody. I try and check them pretty regularly in this day and age. You have to check social media at least every once in a while. So I'm on there and I'm happy to help however I can, whomever I can. And if I can't help, I hope to help you find the person that can be that person that you need right now. So Hopefully we can all rise up together. That's what we need. Support our community. All right. Thanks so much for being with us. Thank you guys. Thanks, it's been a pleasure. All right. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, we're going to take a quick break here and re-rack for Tech Talk. So stay tuned. We'll be right back here on Voice Over Body Shop. This is Bill Ratner, and you're enjoying Voice Over Body Shop with Dan Leonard and George Whittem. VOBS.TV. In these modern times, every business needs a website. When you need a website for your voice acting business, there's only one place to go. Like the name says, voiceactorwebsites.com. Their experience in this niche webmaster market gives them the ability to quickly and easily get you from concept to live online in a much shorter time. When you contact voiceactorwebsites.com, their team of experts and designers really get to know you and what your needs are. They work with you to highlight what you do. Then they create an easily navigable website for your potential clients to get the big picture of who you are and how your voice is the one for them. Plus, voiceactorwebsites.com has other great resources like their practice script library and other resources to help your voiceover career flourish. Don't try it yourself. Go with the pros. VoiceActorWebsites.com, where your VO website shouldn't be a pain in the you-know-what. Well, it's the first time in a while I've got to thank Source Elements for their support of Source. Of, well, they're creating Source Connect and supporting our show over here at VoiceOver Body Shop. Um, boy, that's that's a, Source Connect has come up a lot. I mean, I mean, the pandemic certainly made it a voiceover household word for sure and there's a reason for that it they've been creating this software supporting it and developing it and supporting it and supporting it and supporting it for quite a long time and it, it it's a great tool because and i'm going to show you guys on the tech talk later there's a shelf full of obsolete equipment right up over here and i'm going to really show you how much of this obsolete gear there is that is dead because the technology no longer exists to support it. That was ISDN. Source Connect came along when ISDN was still flourishing and found a way to give you that same kind of real-time communication with the studio, seamless, high-quality audio with low latency over the internet. And because they were there early on and in so many studios, plugged directly into Pro Tools, it is now the reason it is demanded by so many productions. And... Uh, you should probably be at least familiar with it, <laughs> if not owning it. If you want to get familiar with it, get it set up a trial. You'd need to just go to the website, source-elements.com, and set up your, your, your account, 
set up your trial, go through the process of setting it up and learning and orienting yourself. And then you'll be ready to book a job with a little bit of experience and testing, which you can do through their website and you can do also with georgethe.tech. Anyway, thanks for listening and we really appreciate your support. We'll be back to wrap it up after this. You're still watching VLBS? <laughs> yeah, well, Marcy, of course, is still in Italy <laughs> with their friends <laughs> and somebody is like, where's mom? Where is mom? She's barking and growling and doing all those things. And, you know, she's being very clingy, but that's okay. (laughs) Yes. Anyway, uh, we're going to rack it up for a tech talk, but we need to thank people. And we also need to thank the people who donate to our show. And who do we have this week? Donors of the week include Jonathan Grant, Christopher Epperson, Sarah Borges, Philip Sapir, Thomas Pinto, Shelley Avellino. My dad, George Whittem. <laughs> Brian Page. Patty Gibbons. Rob Ryder. R- Greg Thomas. A Doctor Voice. Antland Productions. Shana Pennington Baird. Martha Kahn. Don Griffith. Trey Mosley. Diana Birdsall. Hi, Diana. And Sandra Manwiller. All righty. Boy, that was great having uh, Elise on. She was. That was that was really something. That Fire was hose good. of information. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Which can you take it at a you know, time here? Uh, you've got a discount code on your for your stuff. Yeah, if you book any of the uh, bookable services on our site that you can schedule with myself or any of our team, you can type in VOBS Fan Twenty Twenty Two for twenty percent off, no. and uh, that also works for any of the webinars that we do. In fact, we are doing one that's tomorrow. It's the Audacity Advanced for Voiceover Webinar. So. This one's unique where we're going to answer anything that everybody wants to know. So that's, uh, everything, form. Well, everything, I have, I have a form that's like on my site, like fill this out. Cause whatever you guys want to learn is what I'm going to teach you. You know, exactly. I don't want this to be pre-programmed. So anyway, that is happening. Uh, you can still sneak in there. There's definitely room left in that one. That's, uh, at 3 PM on Tuesday. That's tomorrow. If you're interested, just go to, uh, George, the dot tech slash webinars to sign up and you can use that code VOBS fan 2022. All righty. And we need to thank our sponsors like Harlan Hogan's voiceover essentials, voiceover extra source elements, VOHeroes.com, voice actor websites.com and JMC demos. Uh, big thanks to Jeff Holman for holding the fort down in the chat rooms tonight, doing a great job with that. And, of course, our amazing technical director. We'll all get together soon. Uh, but she keeps it nice and tight. Sue Merlino. And, of course, Lee Penny, just for being Lee Penny. Uh, we're we're going to re-rock it for a tech talk here. If you got tech questions, get sure, make sure you put them in the uh, chat rooms right now. Because George and I love questions about VO Tech. That's why we're here. And... Uh, that's going to do it for us this week. Yeah, not an easy business, but we bring you great people like Elise Burgreen. She, she's got to be a big star. Uh, and uh, that's why we're here. In the meantime, look, if it sounds good, it is good. I'm Dan Leonard. And I'm George Whittem. And this is VoiceOver Body Shop or VO BS. B-S.